Our next speaker is an assistant professor of physical anthropology at the University of Kansas and director and principal investigator at the KU Laboratory of Human Population Genomics. She has a dual PhD in molecular, cellular, and developmental biology and anthropology from Indiana University. Oh my God, there were so many words. She's like really smart and she has a fan club because she spent her childhood in Springfield. Please welcome to the stage, Dr. Jennifer Raff. Hi guys, <laughs> that's my family over there. <laughs> um, so thank you all for coming and this microphone is really strange, okay. Um, and thank you so much to the organizers of this fantastic conference for inviting me, I really appreciate it. Um, it's been a lot of fun, I've met a lot of really interesting people and get to hang out with my family, so. Um, so I know everybody's eager to get to prom and so I promise I'm gonna stay on time and I promise even though it's a talk about genetics, I'm gonna keep it as non-boring as possible. So there will be no Punnett squares, and there will be no Hardy-Weinberg equations, promise. Um, but there is gonna be a lot of science, it's gonna be very science-y, so I hope you guys are all okay with that. <laughs> all right, awesome. <laughs> Um, oh, and one other thing, I wanted to let you know that um, I will be showing a few photos of human remains in this talk. Um, they are specifically crania from the Paracas culture of Peru. I don't do this lightly, I don't usually show human remains in a talk unless I really have no other way of getting a point across. So I just wanted to let you know that that's going to happen. Um, the slides are going to come up early in the, um, in the talk during the discussion of the first genetic myth that I'm going to talk about. Okay, so I'm an anthropological geneticist with a special interest in science communication. Uh, my work primarily focuses on the genetic diversity and the prehistory of the Americas. And so a lot of the examples that I'm going to be talking about today are going to come from Native American populations. Um, and in my work, in, in talking about the prehistory of the Americas, it's brought me into a lot of contact with pseudoscience. And um, so I'll get to that, and that's kind of what is prompting this talk. So I'll get to that soon. But first, I kind of want to talk to you about what exactly an anthropological geneticist is. It's kind of a mouthful, and I don't think too many people know what we do. So I'm going to start with that. Um, anthropological genetis, genetics is a subdiscipline of biological anthropology. Um, biological anthropology concerns itself primarily with the question, what does it mean to be human from a biological perspective? Uh, anthropological geneticists work on all aspects of human and sometimes non-human genetics. Uh, and in general, the field addresses two main questions. I had, ah, yes laser pointer, which you totally can't see. Okay, never mind, don't need it. How do humans differ genetically, and how have aspects of human histories shaped these genetic differences? Much of human history has left its signature in our genomes, and anthropological geneticists study both ancient and modern DNA in order to uncover these signals. So we use the methods and the theory of genetics um, to address evolutionary and cultural questions of human history. We look at different sets of ancestry markers in the human genome, and I'm gonna be talking about a couple of them today. Um, the first, mitochondrial DNA, is DNA present in the mitochondria of your cells. Um, it has a separate genome from what you would think of as in the chromosomes, and in the nucleus. And this DNA is um, maternally inherited, so your mitochondrial lineage is the same as your mother's, and her mother's, and her mother's, and so on. It's non-recombining, so it doesn't swap genes with, the, with, uh, with your chromosomes. And it's present in hundreds to thousands of copies per cell. This makes it a really good target for ancient DNA research because, as we'll be talking about soon, um, ancient DNA is fragmented and scarce. So having a lot of it in a sample 
uh, is what you really want. And so that's why a lot of ancient DNA studies have targeted mitochondrial DNA in order to study the genetic prehistory of a population. Um, but as you might imagine, because it's just maternally inherited, it only tells the story of a small part of your ancestry. And in order to get information about your father's lineage and your, your paternal history, if you have a Y chromosome, which many of us don't, um, you have to study the Y chromosome DNA. Um, and again, that also only provides you with a small subset of your history, but it can be used complementary uh, to the mitochondrial studies. A third approach um, that's becoming more common these days tracks autosomal markers across the genome. So whole genome sequencing captures uh, information from all of an individual's ancestors, as you can sort of see in this photo, and um, it yields much more high-resolution data. So you get a lot more information about a population's history from many fewer individuals. But it's expensive still, pretty, it's pretty expensive, and it's computationally intensive. So as with the Y chromosome, autosomal markers are much less likely to be preserved in ancient remains than mitochondrial genomes. And anthropological genetics is a pretty small field, um, which is why you haven't heard of it, <laughs> especially relative to, say, archaeology. But our research sometimes receives an outsized amount of attention from the media and online. Um, and this level of interest is awesome, but it does leave considerable space for um, people who promote quack ideas about genetics. Uh, and because of my interest in pseudoscience and science literacy, I am in daily contact with myths uh, and conspiracy stories involving human genetics. Um, and many of them have very ugly implications that I don't think we can afford to ignore. So you may have observed, if you have an interest in these sorts of topics, and I assume a lot of people here do, that every scientific and professional discipline seems to have a shadowy pseudo-counterpart. So archaeology has pseudo-archaeology. Astronomy has pseudo-astronomy. Medicine has alternative medicine. And even law has sovereign citizenry and, and, and concepts related to that. These alternatives often use the same jargon, or they try to, um, but they explicitly reject the findings and the methodologies of their more mainstream counterparts. Even though they cover many disparate fields, um, these pseudosciences all share several traits in common. Um, so, for one, they sort of simultaneously distrust institutions while at the same time craving legitimacy that, that mainstream institutions have. Um, they tend to disdain the need to follow a standard path towards obtaining expertise, such as a formal education or apprenticeships or working um, with a mentor who is, um, you know, sort of an expert in the field. Um, and that's not necessarily a bad thing, but it is a common thing in these fields. Um, they also reject the scientific method either completely or parts of it for testing their claims, and they'll often demand special exceptions for their work, and why their research does not have to be published in a journal and peer-reviewed. Um, and then they also, many of them, thrive on being at odds with the scientific community. Um, now, this does not mean, and I cannot stress this enough, that pseudoscientists or lovers of alternative history are stupid. They, some are, some aren't. Um, but they have a very different approach. I want to say worldview, maybe that's too strong, I'm not sure. But they have a different approach. And they feel that they have access to knowledge that the rest of us don't, or that the rest of us won't accept. And they often feel that this knowledge is being actively suppressed by um, scientific and governmental institutions. 
I'm going to be talking about the Smithsonian a lot. <laughs> we'll get to that. Um, so, and then every new, all new knowledge that they encounter is then put into this framework. So, for example, every time one of my colleagues publishes a paper uh, with a new finding about ancient DNA in the Americas, there is a flurry of activity among um, uh, alternative historians, alternative archaeologists in forums and blogs where they will talk about uh, how this is undermining mainstream history every time, every time. And then finally, finally, the scientists will wake up and, and have to be forced to admit the truth about whatever, whatever the truth is. Um, this doesn't ever work out for them, but they continue to, to see it this way. Um, proponents of alternative histories, and that's mostly what I'm going to be talking about, at least in the first half of my talk, um, they've realized in the last decade or so that claims about the past can be strengthened by adopting DNA evidence for components of their ideas. And the recent democratization of commercial genetic ancestry testing um, has caused a a surge of tremendous interest in what our DNA can tell us. Um, so who we are, uh, where we come from, what kind of athletes we might become, uh, even our food preferences are said to be coded in our DNA. Um, so you guys are skeptics. I think you, you, know, you, you may approach this with a skeptical attitude. But to many people, this just makes sense because they don't know what the limitations of ancestry testing are. So we're going to talk a little bit about those later in the talk. Um, for want of a better term, and if anybody can come up with a better term, please let me know. <laughs> I don't really like this term. But I'm going to call the use of genetics in the service of pseudoscience pseudogenetics. Um, just as genetics is an incredibly diverse field of study, encompassing the study of disease and evolution and every organism on Earth, past or present, uh, its counterpart covers a lot of ground as well. So the common link between all of the different examples that I'm going to be giving you today is that they attempt to use the language and the authority of genetics to at, to add support to pseudoscientific ideas. And pseudogenetics is employed in the construction of genetic myths, or what I'm calling genetic myths. Again, if you have a better term for it, please let me know. Um, interestingly, I think it's interesting anyway, these myths are often in response to new developments in the field or, new, or resistance to new ideas. So I'm going to go through a few examples tonight, uh, and some of them are silly and relatively harmless, and some of which have much more serious consequences that I think we all need to think about. So I'm going to divide them into two groups. The first is the myths about the past, and I'm going to be focusing really only on one today, um, or tonight. This idea, uh, it, it concerns Nephilim and aliens and ancient DNA, so it's a lot of fun. And the second uh, group is myths about the present. And so we're going to be talking about genetic astrology and some of the um, limits, shall we say, of genetic ancestry testing. And then we're also going to be talking about Rutherford's Law. Um, as we go through tonight, we'll um, also touch on how to recognize pseudoscience uh, in the service of genetic myths and hopefully add a few more tools to your skeptical toolkit. So I'm sure you guys have all seen some version of this quote before. Everything you learned about history in school was a lie. I see it literally every day. Um, the idea at the heart of alternative history and alternative archaeology is that there is a conspiracy on the part of all mainstream stream academics and institutions like the Smithsonian. They are very fixated on the Smithsonian. Um, to promote a single false mainstream history. To this end, they, or perhaps I should say we, because they definitely include me in this group, um, have hidden or destroyed evidence, um, passed laws forbidding independent researchers from conducting their own excavations, or as we would call it, treasure hunting or pot hunting. Um, and, using, and, and then they say that we also use peer review to suppress 
dissenting voices from um, the, the published literature. So I think it's worth asking, what is it that, what is this truth about history that these institutions and people like me are suppressing? Um, so there are, it's kind of confusing because there are a lot of opinions about this. Many um, center around religious narratives about the past. So, for example, with regard to North America, again, this is the thing that I spend the most of my time thinking about, um, so I'm most familiar about North America. Um, biblical stories about Nephilim and um, Mormon stories about the presence of light-skinned, read European or Middle Eastern, uh, people are all sort of mashed together into this idea that there were ancient Europeans or giants or aliens running around the landscape in North America prior to um, European contact and also prior to the ancestors of Native Americans being here. Um, and so that this narrative promotes this idea that the original people of the Americas were not the ancestors of contemporary Native Americans. And then people's cherished ideas, whether that is Bigfoot or aliens, are then sort of slotted into this narrative somehow. And then the whole thing is tied together with the suppression attempts on the part of the Smithsonian to, to squash their, you know, their studies. So um, here are the skulls. I probably should have warned you before the slide. I'm sorry. Um, so one of the myths that I'm going to be discussing um, about American prehistory is, that is very relevant because it is right now trying to invoke the authority of genetics to lend it veracity. Um, and this is the idea that there were once Nephilim or perhaps aliens who roamed North America whose remains are recognizable by their unusually shaped crania, or crania meaning skull. Um, and it's as depicted in this photo. Um, if you don't know what Nephilim are, don't feel bad. I didn't know either, I had to look this up. Uh, they are a race of individuals in the Bible. They are the offspring of the sons of God and the daughters of man. And I think they're giants, or they're considered to be giants, or they're hybrids between giants and humans. So I see different accounts and different descriptions. So as I said, the proponents of this particular myth are increasingly trying to use ancient DNA to add legitimacy to it. So this photo is from a fundraising page um, by Dr. Melba Ketchum. How many of you guys have heard of Dr. Ketchum? PZ has heard of Dr. Ketchum. <laughs> um, so for the rest of you, Dr. Ketchum is a veterinarian and, and forensic uh, specialist who claims to have sequenced the Sasquatch genome. I... <laughs> I actually had about 20 slides in this talk on why she didn't, but I had to take them out because it was way too long, so I'm sorry. If you would like to hear me rant about why she did not, <laughs> she did not sequence the Sasquatch genome, I would be very happy to get into a very detailed discussion with you after the talk about Q scores and all sorts of things, but for now, we're, we're going to... We're going to move on. So Dr. Ketchum is trying to raise money um, to extract, analyze DNA extracted from human remains. The red-headed giants, which I believe are those individuals there, and um, Peruvian mummies from the Paracas culture, whose crania show this unusual morphology. So I'm going to state up front that the claim that they're not human is nonsense. You guys know this already, but let's, let's talk about it. Um, the human cranium is extremely malleable throughout early childhood. Uh, as you know, the, probably, <laughs> the, in infancy, the cranial bones are not fused. And it turns out that you can modify the shape of a human cranium through wrapping or binding the skull um, in certain ways as a child develops. This has been a surprisingly common practice among different cultures all over the world, uh, including the Americas. And you might ask, well, why are they doing this? Why do they want their skulls to look this way? Um, and so the reasons are, are varied. Um, a lot of them we have to just infer from archaeological 
um, evidence. Uh, in, in a lot of contexts, including the Paracas, we see um, these distinctively shaped crania associated with high status burials. We infer high status from lots of really nice grave goods, things like that. So as I was saying, um, we were talking about the reasons for why people might do this to their, the skulls of their children. Um, um, other reasons, including status symbol, might also be simple, you know, beauty. Um, people may have thought that this really looked good. They are very distinctive. Imagine what a person with a cranium shaped like that looked like. Um, so it may simply have been aesthetic. Um, the Paracas people who occupied the northern coast of, oh, sorry, the southern coast of Peru between 800 and 100 BCE um, are among the best known practitioners of this modification precisely because people keep making claims that they're not human. And you have, if you watch the History Channel, have probably seen such claims. I'm sorry, this keeps slipping. Um, yeah, so I don't really know why Dr. Ketchum is interested in these remains exactly. I think, so she suggested that giant bones hidden in the Smithsonian are somehow related to Sasquatch. Um, and I think these red-headed giants are, are, are things, she's interested in them because they may represent um, skeletons that are not controlled by the Smithsonian. Uh, <laughs> she also seems to think, I, I think it's kind of hard to tell, that these ancient Peruvians are somehow connected to Bigfoot, but I really don't quite follow the, the logic there. So, and I haven't really delved deep enough into the forums to quite understand why. So it's not entirely clear. But she's not the only person doing this. Um, there are two other individuals, uh, tour guide Brian Forrester, who's a Peruvian tour guide, and author, lecturer, filmmaker, L.A. Marzulli. Um, they're currently the two major promoters of the ancient Peruvians or Nephilim idea. Marzulli has written several books and he's made several movies on the subject, and I am now giving him a lot of free press, but I think it's worth examining his claims. Um, and I, I should mention, and I didn't even talk about this, I have a blog, <laughs> and I've written about this quite extensively on my blog. You can go read more details if you're interested. Uh, it's uh, violetmetaphors.com. Um, so these two have been involved in two rounds of DNA testing on uh, remains of these individuals uh, from the Paracas culture, um, privately owned. Okay. Please note that they are looking for a very specific kind of result. They want to prop up their idea that the Paracas individuals are not human. So they're looking for anomalous DNA lineages uh, from their remains and that don't fit with our understanding of genetic diversity of the Americas and particularly of Peru. And there are lots and lots of DNA studies of Peruvians, both contemporary and ancient. So we have a pretty good idea of what people in that region looked like genetically. Unfortunately, so these guys don't seem to care what result they get as long as it's anomalous and unfortunately, if you do ancient DNA less than stringently, shall we say, uh, you are going to get all sorts of spurious results that will look like anomalies. Um, I think it's worth spending a little bit of time talking about ancient DNA research um, and so you guys can see exactly what's needed to do it correctly. So first I should say ancient DNA presents a lot of challenges. Um, so, once an organism dies, the processes that keep the DNA repaired um, stop. And so the DNA begins to fragment, degrade, uh, da gets damaged, and this all makes it incredibly sensitive to modern contamination. Incredibly sensitive. So I'm going to be like talking about contamination a lot and ranting about it a lot for the next few slides, so just, you know, bear with me. We all think about this like all the time. Um, so that's one set of challenges. Another set of challenges is ethical issues. Um, DNA, in order to get DNA out of human remains, usually it's a destructive process. And so you have to carefully consider a project that you're going to do, um, and it's extremely important to consult with descendant populations about whether or not they're comfortable with you 
doing a destructive analysis of part of their ancestors' remains. Some people are, and some people are not. And, and, and the field is really moving in the direction of consultation with all stakeholders as much as possible before you do the research, and that's important. So, after some embarrassing results uh, due to contamination from the early days of the field, um, does anybody remember the dinosaur DNA back in the 90s? I mean, I'm not talking about Jurassic Park, but I'm talking about the actual published literature on dinosaur DNA. Um, okay, well, it was contamination, and it was very embarrassing. And, I mean, I was still in high school, so it was okay, but the field remembers. <laughs> the field remembers. And so researchers, ancient DNA researchers, developed an extremely stringent set of criteria and protocol for mitigating contamination and detecting it when it is there. Um, and so these are just a few of the most basic standards that you have to follow. So I'm just going to go through them briefly. So you cannot, ancient DNA has to be done in a special lab. This lab has to be positively pressured. So the opposite, you know, you have to have airflow going out instead of airflow going in because you want, um, you don't want contaminants getting into the lab. So all the air goes out. Um, the air has to be HEPA filtered. You have to control the access to only a few people who really know how to work in there. So not anybody can just go in there. Um, and you have to decontaminate all surfaces, all equipment, all materials that you're working with, with bleach. So you can't be bleach sensitive. I, you just, you're, you're surrounded by bleach fumes constantly. Um, and, you have to, and you also decontaminate with UV irradiation, um, which destroys DNA. You also have to wear protective clothing, and here is an example of protective clothing. That's me. Um, I actually cringe every time I use this picture, not because it's goofy, but because if you notice, if you look closely at the picture, you'll see my hand, so I'm shadow boxing. You see my hand is um, very close to my face, and my glove is very close to the part of my face that's not covered by my mask. And if it touches my face, <laughs> I could easily transfer my own DNA onto my glove, and then my glove onto surfaces, reagents, and whatever samples I'm working with. So, I want to assure you that immediately after this picture was taken, I did take my gloves off and put new ones on and bleached and so forth. Um, but this is what we wear when we're in the ancient DNA lab. And in addition to these, this garb, we also, at least in my lab, um, we, in all the labs I've been in, we bleach ourselves. We literally spray ourselves down with bleach and wipe it off so that there is no DNA on us, we hope. Um, and then we also have to use disposable single-use, DNA-free products, reagents that are extremely expensive. And then we have to have, and this is really important, separate labs for pre- and post-amplification work. Um, uh, I say PCR, I'm not sure if everybody knows what that is. Polymerase chain reaction, that's how you make lots and lots of copies of DNA. And you don't want those copies getting back into the lab because then they will contaminate your samples. So we have to have those labs very separate. Everything brought into the laboratory, everything you see in this photograph right here, um, has to be thoroughly bleached and UV irradiated, every single thing. All reagents have to be purchased in small, ultra-pure aliquots, and that includes water, very important, think about water, we'll be talking about that in a second. The entire laboratory is paper-free, no notebooks, no paper, nothing. We take all our notes on tablets that can be bleached. Uh, nobody is allowed to enter the lab without donning full garb, and nobody can enter who's been anywhere near the post-PCR lab. So all of this helps a lot, but you still have to be able to detect contamination when it occurs, and it will occur, it always occurs. Um, so we run negative controls at every stage of the process, um, and every person who works in the lab and every single person who has ever handled the skeletal material that we work with, that we can track down, and we sequence their DNA so that we have a database and we can compare. When we get results, we compare it to our database of, of personnel. So we can tell, oh, okay, Justin contaminated this sample and I'm gonna go after him next week. I'm kidding, that's Justin right there. He's uh, my postdoc, he's amazing. Uh, much better in the lab than I am, actually. So the point is, you can't do this as a hobby. Even professional geneticists can't just set up an ancient DNA hood in the corner of their lab and kind of work on it on the side. You just can't. Their results would not be accepted by the ancient DNA community. We wouldn't let them publish them. We're very harsh, but we have to be. 
Okay, so now that you know a lot about ancient DNA, let's return to the pseudoscience. Um, several years ago, Forrester sent skeletal samples from some individuals from the Paracas culture with unusually shaped crania to a geneticist, an anonymous geneticist. We have no idea who this individual is. And he received a report that they had mitochondrial DNA with mutations unknown in any human, primate, or animal known so far. So here is an image from the video of them sampling. And I go into a lot more detail about what exactly they did wrong, but I'll give you a short version here. So I have marked the areas of potential contamination here. Uh, exposed hair, exposed skin. This guy's beard, uh, you can't really see it in the photograph. It's kind of um, not, it's really bright. You can't really see it, but his beard is like out. And it, oh, it makes me cringe. <laughs> in, in addition, they didn't follow any of the ways to mitigate surface contamination. They didn't bleach, they didn't do UV, they actually scraped off some stuff and then they, and then they squirted water onto the samples to clean it. And I mentioned, you know, we gotta use ultra pure water, right? Because regular water has DNA in it. And so they probably contaminated the hell out of it just by doing that. <laughs> so um, these unknown mutations are likely to be a combination of both contamination and ancient DNA damage, if they had any ancient DNA, I don't even know. Um, I could tell if I could actually see the sequences, but of course they didn't publish them, they just used, issued press releases, wrote books and websites about it. So yeah, you can't tell you. Okay, so recently L.A. Marzulli has claimed to con have conducted a second set of ancient DNA tests on, in his book, Nephilim Hybrids, Hybrids, Chimeras, and Strange Demonic Creatures. Um, the strange demonic creature, by the way, turns out to have been a forgery, so. I, I'm not gonna say by his book, but it's, it's actually pretty interesting. Um, he insists that the newest DNA tests were conducted completely legitimately um, under all the good anti-contamination uh, protocols, and yet the results show they were Nephilim European hybrids. I was interested, so I read his book. Um, so here's a screenshot from the promo of his book, and it shows them sampling in the second round of tests. And as you can see, it's actually a lot better. They're wearing Tyvek suits, um, they're wearing gloves, they're wearing sleeve guards, there's no exposed skin, at least that I could see. But if you read his description of how they did it, they, again, did not decontaminate the surface with, with bleach or UV. They drilled into the skull using a Dremel, um, and they didn't clean the Dremel first with bleach, um, but then after they drilled into the skull, they cleaned the area with compressed air. <laughs> so, yeah, uh, cleaning the area with compressed air is gonna do exactly the same thing as pouring water on it. It's going to indu introduce contamination, introduce DNA. Um, and in fact, photographs of the cranium showed to be extremely shiny. And that, to me, suggests that it had some kind of shellac or preservative on it. That preservative, when applied, would have trapped the DNA of anybody who had handled the cranium prior to that in it. And then, so you drill into there and then you squirt air into it and you're just blowing in more DNA. It's, oh, it's a disaster. So, um, Another good thing they did, though, I will give them credit for this, is instead of sending their results to a random geneticist, they sent them to a legitimate commercial ancient DNA lab. And I'm not gonna mention the name of that lab out of professional courtesy. I know who they are, they're good. Um, and they are in no way responsible for Marzulli's interpretation of their results. They gave him all the caveats that they should have. So this laboratory returned two results to him. Um, mitochondrial lineage, T2B, which is uh, not an autochthonous Native American lineage. I think it's European. I'm, I'm not really up on my European lineages. I think it's either European or Middle Eastern, something like that. And also B4, which is a lineage seen commonly in the Americas and especially in Peru, actually. Um, they cautioned they could not guarantee the legitimacy of either one because they were not involved in the initial collection of the sample, and that is proper for them to say, because the actual extraction of DNA depends on what you're extracting from, right? So when you extract DNA, you're gonna extract all the DNA present in the sample. Um, now it's interesting, Marzulli completely ignored the finding of haplogroup B4, and it's quite common, like I said, in ancient and contemporary South American populations, um, presumably because before would fit with the archeological interpretation that these individuals were indigenous to the region. 
If I were reviewing that paper, I still wouldn't accept that result as legitimate because they didn't follow proper protocols. But B4 is certainly a lot more likely to be the, the genuine result than um, T2B. But Marzulli loves the fact that there's a European lineage there. And I would actually be very interested in what lineage he has or what lineage his you know, other people who were in the room had because, but they didn't sequence their own DNA or if they did, they didn't mention it. So we don't, we are not able to compare with it. Um, what else? Oh yeah, so his interpretation of this result as best as I can understand it is that the Prochus individuals have European maternal, European mothers and European human mothers and Nephilim fathers. And I don't quite know where he gets the Nephilim fathers part from, unless he's referencing the previous study that said that the DNA had no known mutations from any person or organism. So, um, so it's a mess. But the point is, he's anomaly hunting. And with ancient DNA, if you do things less than perfectly, you are gonna get anomalies if you look for them. And he's ignoring the facts that are inconvenient for his narrative. So I think it's fair to ask, with regard to each genetic myth, um, what the harm is in it. And in this case, there's two major harms. The first is that this research is completely unethical. Uh, it's done by inexperienced people on privately owned skeletons, and there's no consultation with indigenous stakeholders at all that I can tell. I mean, if there is, good for them, but they are not publishing it, they are not talking about that. These, they're doing the work on privately owned cranium. Um, and secondly, this research is attempting to delegitimize a scientific understanding of the past in order to push a specific agenda. And these agen this agenda is one that I said earlier, that people other than Native Americans were here in the Americas before European contact, um, and that others were responsible in whole or in part for the techno technological and cultural accomplishments of indigenous Americans whether it be effigy mounds, geoglyphs, or pyramids. In fact, this quote, I think, really exemplifies this idea. Yes, Native Americans lived at the pyramid complex and must have stood in wonder at these amazing structures built long before a single native foot stepped onto the North American continent. Archaeologists do not agree with this narrative at all. Um, I found this, I can't remember, oh, um, some blog. I mean, it wasn't, this is not Marzulli's quote, but it fits with this narrative, right? Uh, Brad Lepper, the cura curator of archeology span for uh, the Ohio Historical Society, who does a lot of debunking of this sort of thing, written extensively about this, um, and the so-called myth of the mound builders, which was created by European settlers in the Americas, um, and they did not want to believe that the mounds and other spectacular examples of monumental architecture was built by the ancestors of the people that they encountered. Um, instead, they claimed they had been built by a superior race of beings who were killed off by contemporary Native Americans. Um, and so Leper states, this casts the indigenous American Indian in the role of relatively recent intruders whose tenuous title to the land was based merely on conquest. Under these circumstances, the Europeans need not have felt any compunction about sweeping aside the supposed savage hordes to reclaim the land on, be on behalf of civilization. So I, oops, went wrong way. So my point is this narrative is not new. It fits with a long tradition of Europeans attempting to insert themselves in Native American history. And if you think that this does not have political implications, you have not been paying attention to the news recently. Okay, so we're gonna move now to the present, to genetic myths about the present, present day patterns of human variation uh, and what your genome can tell you. These myths are everywhere, um, whether you realize it or not. So everything from your warrior abilities, um, and if we have any MMA fans in the audience who are not actually watching the fights tonight, um, that's George St. Pierre in the photo, uh, to your preferences in wine are said to be encoded in your DNA. And you can bet there is a company ready to sell you a test to help you uncover truths about yourself and wine. <laughs> so for example, the testing company uh, Connect My DNA will give you a genetics test that, and a personality test 
that will help you discover your interests um, by comparing you to populations all around the world. Uh, and you'll discover that you like a particular nation's cuisine because you have ancestry from that nation. Um, and this is an actual claim that they make. And so this is all part of myth number two, genetic astrology. This term was coined, I believe, by researchers at University of College London, um, including uh, Debbie Kennett, who maintains an excellent web-based resource about these topics. I can't recommend it enough. Um, so findings from population genetics research have been increasingly adopted by commercial companies uh, and applied to studying families and individuals, um, genetic histories and, um, and ethnicities. So used properly with an understanding of limitations, um, genetic ancestry testing can be extremely useful and interesting, um, helpful in genealogical research, but uh, this field is rife with pseudoscience, as you saw from some of the examples I just gave you. Um, there are a great many reasons for doing genetic ancestry testing, including filling in gaps in family histories, um, validating family stories, or invalidating them in many cases, uh, and searching for connections or, or um, homelands. But there are some serious problems when ancestry testing companies deliberately conflate genetic ancestry testing with cultural identity. As Ancestry DNA does in this video, which many of you have probably seen because this commercial is everywhere, um, and it's a commercial about a woman who's talking about how she discovered that she had Native American ancestry, uh, and she's standing in front of cultural items that are specific to a particular tribe. So it's worth asking, what can ancestry testing tell you? So it can tell you where some people in the world today are who share the same DNA as you. And if you combine it with genealogy, it can yield you some interesting information about your family history and your relatives. If you combine it with ancient DNA, which is kind of rare because it's expensive, but if you do it that way, or you do combine it with tests of known relatives, it can help you make specific ancestor descendant identifications. This is, for example, how Thomas Jefferson was, or one of his brothers, was identified as the father of Sally Hemings' children, um, how the skeleton of Richard III was identified, and how the Romanov family was identified. But there's a lot of things that ancestry testing cannot tell you. Um, so for one, it can't tell you where everyone who shares your DNA currently lives. We don't have a complete uh, picture of genetic variation worldwide, far from it. In some cases, um, in some cases, present day patterns of genetic variation reflect what was there in the past. But populations are not static. Um, people move around a lot. The gene pool in a region changes over time. And so whether or not your ancestors lived in a particular time, in a particular place, may not square up to how genetic variation looks like today. So you can't always tell where people who are ancestral to you necessarily come from. And you can't tell that you were definitely descended from famous person X unless we have ancient DNA from that person or DNA from his or her known relatives. The last point I think is really important, and it goes back to that slide I showed you of the woman standing in front of the cult Native American cultural items. Um, ancestry testing cannot tell you who you are. This question really matters to people. Um, in the United States, these ancestry testing companies are very successful because I think in part of our history as a nation of immigrants, whether voluntary or involuntary. Um, we are, many of us, disconnected from our distant ancestors. Many people take comfort in the knowledge that they can't come from somewhere, um, come from somewhere concrete. And so I want to stress that this presentation is not to discourage that or discourage the use of ancestry testing to do these things, but to simply point out the limitations of it. Um, so this afternoon, I had a chat with my grandmother um, who kept talking about how Polish I am. Uh, and I'm Polish through my father's side of the family. Uh, and this is despite the fact that my mother's family is Irish and English and, and of various things. And I had to keep reminding her, Grandma, I'm descended from you too. <laughs> and you're Irish, or you're English, and my grandfather, my maternal grandfather is, is Irish. Um, 
So I, I thought this was a great little incident because it lets me sort of illustrate this question, like who counts as your ancestor? Uh, deciding which parts of your ancestry count or are meaningful to you um, is a very subjective decision. And it may not reflect your entire genetic ancestry. So you had 256 ancestors eight generations ago. That's, there's enormous stochastic variation in which parts of your genome come from any given ancestor of yours. So you have to make the decision who counts as your ancestor and what does that mean for you. Another limitation of these ancestry testing companies and the claims that they make is the database that they're comparing your DNA to. So you're going to get a result if you're doing autosomal DNA. You're going to get a result of you are X percentage European, X percentage African, X percentage um, Asian, whatever. And there, that percentage reflects the amount of ancestry in your genome that they've tested that come from populations in their database. Um, that means that their results are only as good as their databases. And often these databases are proprietary, so you don't necessarily know who's in what populations are represented in each one. And as I said earlier, um, we know for sure that they do not have complete coverage of all populations on the globe. This is getting better as more and more people take these tests, but there are still quite a few gaps, sampling gaps. And the results are probabilistic. Um, so if you look at enough genetic markers, you can identify the likely region where somebody shares DNA with others. Um, and that can be, and it often is, the place where he or she derives ancestry. But it's important to remember, like I said earlier, that the gene pool in different regions over the world has changed significantly over time. And that's because populations move around. And so also no sequence, no genetic sequence is diagnostic of a population. So I think, again, it's fair to ask what is the harm here if people don't necessarily understand these important caveats in interpreting their genetic ancestry results. So for starters, I think, and I'm not alone in thinking of this, the not understanding um, the caveats in ancestry testing tends to reify the concept of biological race. Now, talking about biological race is really a subject for an entire talk, and I'm gonna try and do it in one slide, so um, please accept that this topic is complicated, uh, if you didn't know that already, um, which you probably did. So we conceive of genetic variation between populations as something like this, right? There's like continental, populations or races or whatever you're going to call them that are, you know, distinctive and they have some overlap. But really, it's actually more like this. Um, humans have patterned genetic diversity and nobody is arguing with that. Um, but more variation, most variation is found within any racial group than between them. Um, and races are culturally constructed um, based in part on biological features and in part on uh, historic socio-political rules about uh, ancestry. Thus, racial categories vary from culture to culture. Um, our racial categories are often based on superficial traits like skin color. They don't always match up all that well to a person's ancestry. Furthermore, our conception of, races, of race implies that populations are static um, and that they're immobile and unchanging. But we know that the opposite is true. So if there's anything that ancient DNA has told us, it's that there has been a lot of changes and a lot of movements and migrations and sex with other populations and sex with other hominins uh, and many other evolutionary forces. Um, but a lot of the marketing from these ancestry testing companies sort of promotes misleading ideas about human variation and history. And there are some extremely unscrupulous companies out there, including ones that market to individuals who are seeking to prove Native American ancestry and obtain tribal affiliation through that proof. 
So this one, for example, will actually provide you with a certificate showing you the percentage of Cherokee that you are. Now, there are over 480, I think, <laughs> federally recognized tribes, and this company claims to have DNA from 20 of them. What people may not realize is that there are no tribal-specific markers out there. In fact, very little is known about the genetic variation of North America, and that's why I work there, work here. Um, and in addition, these attempts to prove genetic affinity with a particular tribe is deeply offensive to many Native Americans who are members of tribes by virtue of, you know, actually belonging to the tribe, being part of its culture in all aspects. Um, and so this attempt by commercial ancestry companies to make a profit off giving others affiliation or trying to is often seen as threatening to tribal sovereignty and self-determination. So DNA tests may well show you that you have Native American ancestry, but that doesn't make you culturally Native American. Um, and so the Native American and Indigenous Studies Association, NASA, uh, articulated it really well. They say that belonging does not arise simply from individual feelings. It is not simply who you claim to be, but also who claims you. Um, and according to the UN Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues, Statement on Indigenous Identity, the test is self-identification as Indigenous peoples um, at the individual level and accepted by the community as their member. Accepted by the community. Okay. So let's be clear. This exploitation could happen to, and does happen, to any identifiable distinctive minority group. There is targeted potentially at least, targeted um, marketing to any distinctive minority group. Um, so, to summarize, ancestry testing is fun, and it can be really helpful. But just recognize that it's a commercial endeavor, and understand the motivations of the companies. Um, when what they promote extends beyond what the science can support, um, it perpetuates genetic myths. And that brings us to our third and final genetic myth. This one's really pervasive. How many of you guys have heard this, this or read this sentence before in, in a newspaper? Yeah, okay, we all have, right? Okay, um, this headline is now known as Rutherford's Law after British geneticist and author Adam Rutherford. Um, and he just has a new book out, uh, which you all should read if you're interested in these topics, although I don't think it's out in its American edition yet, so keep an eye out for it. Um, and Rutherford's law goes, if a headline states that scientists have discovered a gene for X, where X is a complex human trait, um, they haven't, because that gene does not exist. So I'm going to give you an example. My dear Aunt Joan is here. <laughs> and uh, she is appalled that I don't have any aptitude for knitting at all. <laughs> And she is a, quite an accomplished knitter. And we were just joking earlier about why I don't have the gene for knitting. <laughs> that seems like a ridiculous idea, right? You guys know this. Um, knitting is a trait that one uh, develops through instruction and practice. But it's no sillier than some of the examples I'm about to show you. Um, and these are actual headlines from the news. So did you know, and I guess you can't really read those, kind of small, so I'll read them to you. Did you know that scientists have found a gay gene that can help predict your sexuality? Scientists have discovered a happiness gene. Scientists uh, have discovered a transsexual gene that makes men feel like women. A uh, gene that can scare you out of your mind. <laughs> Or the gene that makes you lean to the left, how genetic variants determine your political views. Um, and I like this one. This is the love cheat gene, one in four born to be unfaithful, claim scientists. Or the gene that makes you good at taking risky decisions. So what's going on here? <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, this is my favorite. It's really dire. Study, a gene predicts what time of day you will die. <laughs> that is so depressing. <laughs> so what's going on here? <laughs> Why are these writers putting out these 
misleading headlines. Um, so one answer is that there's less and less money available for good science journalism, increasing incentives to get page views. So reporters or maybe their editors are employing clickbait headlines to like these. Um, and they exploit the fact that most people fundamentally misunderstand genetics. Um, so this is where I'm not showing you Punnett Square. Uh, most people, most of you will remember, I hope, that high school biology, from high school biology, that Gregor Mendel worked out the rules of inheritance by looking at pea plant traits, such as whether peas were round, wrinkled, yellow, or green. Um, so Mendel was lucky as well as clever because all of the traits he looked at happened to be controlled by one gene apiece. We have a few traits that are like this, such as our ability to roll our tongues, and I'm sure everybody in the audience is doing that right now. Uh, so in the years since Mendel, we've learned that most human traits are more complex, um, influenced by more than one gene. And of course, genetics is only part of the story. Environmental uh, factors, development, and culture even all play a critical role in shaping complex human traits. So that's why headlines like these, scientists discover height gene, are so ridiculous. We've long known that variation in adult height is influenced by, both by the additive effects of different genes, or I'm going to use the word loci here, just bear with me, um, as well as nutrition and exercise and how your development uh, went as a child and that sort of thing. So this was published in 2007, and even in those dark ages, you know that we for sure knew back in those days that <laughs> there was no single height gene. <laughs> So now we have the ability to scan the entire genome, um, and we can look much more deeply at the inheritance of complex traits um, through genome-wide association studies, or we call them GWAS, um, and they look at genetic markers across the complete genomes of people who have and do not have a particular trait or a disease. Um, and we see what variants are statistically associated with that trait. Um, and so this study, this is a GWAS study done in 2014 on 250,000 subjects. And this is the author list, which is insane. I, uh, yeah, insane. Um, and we've learned from that study that there's at least 697 genomic regions associated with height. So when you add up the effects of each of those loci, there, it turns out it really only accounts for a little bit of variation in height. So there's a lot more to be learned, but there's absolutely no way there can be a gene for height. Um, there's hundreds and hundreds. And intelligence is another example of a complex trait that's about 45 to 55% genetically determined, at least as measured by IQ, and the validity of determining genetic intelligence by IQ is a subject for a whole nother talk. Um, but the remainder is affected by development and socioeconomic status, growing up, education, how much your parents encourage you to read, that sort of thing. Many, many loci are involved in intelligence, each with a very small effect. Um, so stories like this one, new research establishes that intelligence is inherited from the mother, um, are wrong. <laughs> uh, I saw this on my Facebook friends' feeds a, a few weeks ago, and intelligent people who I really respect were sharing this and going, oh yeah, that makes sense. Um, I'm going to leave it to you to, on your own, debunk this statement that's made in there. Mom genes are activated in the cerebral cortex where intelligence develops, and dad genes are activated in the limbic system, which controls basic feelings like anger, hunger, and Super Bowl. Yeah, that's so stupid, it's not even wrong, but you guys can debunk that on your own time. We have to move on. <laughs> so clickbait headlines increase the visibility of pseudoscience regarding what DNA can and can't tell us, and oversimplifying the inheritance of complex traits gives space to the resurgence of racist ideas, such as the notion that some races are more intelligent than others. So what can we learn from all these genetic myths? One lesson is that each is conducted broadly, using wrong methodology, um, assuming a conclusion and then building a case. Um, and so this is an example, this is the last remaining Bigfoot slide that didn't get cut from my talk. Um, this quote I liked because it's a really good example of the mentality. What we are longing for is some definitive DNA proof that we can take to the scientific community at large and prove to them that these creatures exist. Um, so this is the opposite of how research should be done, which is, you know, you make a null hypothesis and then you attempt to falsify it. Here they want to start with a conclusion and then build a case for it. Uh, pseudogenetics teaches us the same things as other forms of pseudoscience, so namely that expertise matters in research, that peer review is um, a powerful and critical form of quality control, 
and that confirmation bias is pervasive. So I hope the next time you see a headline about genetics on Facebook, you will take a moment and ask yourself, is this a myth, before sharing it. So here's a couple of things to guide your consideration. Number one, does this make a claim about a gene for complex trait, or Rutherford's law? Number two, does this invoke a conspiracy of suppression from scientists and uh, institutions as an argument for legitimacy? Um, and three, if an ancient DNA study, does it explicitly list the contamin anti-contamination measures taken? Uh, you are now all experts on ancient DNA, so you know what those are. Um, but, you know, you don't necessarily have access to the study. I realize that. Um, I'm quite privileged that I'm at a university. I can read whatever I want, um, but there are paywalls and so forth. So one thing you can do is look at a news article and ask in the news article, does this say where the study was published? If it was published in a legitimate journal, did it pass peer review, or is this science by press release, or is it published in somebody's book? Um, okay, so I finally I want to close by thanking my husband, Colin, um, who also writes for my blog, Violent Metaphors, and he actually did the series on the conspiracy cruise. He was on that cruise. I don't know if any of you guys read it or heard about it. If you haven't, you should read it because it's a lot of fun. Um, I also want to thank my dentist, <laughs> uh, Grant Ritchie, who is a friend and the host of the most excellent skeptic podcast, Prism Podcast, um, and he gave me a lot of help and feedback on this talk. And I want to thank the scholars whose work I cited extensively, including Dr. Adam Rutherford, Dr. Deborah Bolnick, Dr. Kim Talbert, Dr. Chris Anderson. And uh, I want to thank the um, members of the Free State Skeptics who saw an earlier version of this talk, which was totally different. Um, and also thanks to Skepticon organizers and you guys for coming. And that is my dog, Alu. And the name is, yes, a genetics joke. If we have any genetics geneticists in the audience, her name is Alu. Um, and this is her Halloween costume. She was a lion. So <laughs> thank you all.